Sen ve çanda kuntuduk işte. Bunda dermana de facto ne tutuyun zaçnar. Da şimdi bu tehin, o da inovasyon gitti. Tırni mi rujiltin? Amerikan, New Yorkin, Osik Sorgulin, Profesör, Doktor, Fred Phillips, Arthur Bena. Good afternoon. Welcome to Mongolia. Thank you for having me on your program. I have heard you speaking about very interesting observations on several countries about success and failure of innovation. Can we talk one by one? Certainly. Let's talk about Korea first, where you have mm -hmm. been living too. How do you yes. find innovation there being a, a factor of progress that this country made recently? Uh, well, Korea has made great progress in incremental innovations. I, uh, the Koreans understand that uh, becoming more creative is going to be uh, their next challenge. Uh, they want courses in creativity. This is one reason why they've invited the, the foreign universities mm -hmm. to come to Korea. Well, please tell us about that part. What, yes, what, yes. What happened and why you were invited there? Before we started uh, rolling the camera, I was telling you that um, the Korean government, uh, the Ministry of Education, and the Incheon Free Economic Zone cooperated to uh, build a, a campus that so far has been a half billion dollars in infrastructure and will be more as they continue to expand that campus to invite uh, American and European universities to locate in Korea. Uh, I worked for the State University of New York system, and they were the first to join this multi-campus in Incheon. There are now four international universities there, and ultimately they hope to have 10 or 12. Like what universities? Uh, University of Utah is there, uh, George Mason University from Virginia, and Gant University from Belgium. And um, for example, uh, Korea University, which is one of the top Korean universities uh, has a joint grant with SUNY, and they send their um, their third year undergraduate software engineering students to SUNY every summer for courses uh, in engineering management that they hope will make them more creative software engineers. Of course, of course, yes, it's a wonderful idea. China tried, and China yeah. still has some universities with certain U.S. and U.K. Com uh, universities. Mm -hmm. So you think that this sort of knowledge and, trans uh, knowledge and technology transfer it's in a way, isn't it? Uh, yes, this <coughs> serves a number of national purposes in Korea yep. uh, that they can make this transition to a more creative economy. Mm -hmm. and, and second, they've sent students overseas for many decades and benefited from what the knowledge they've brought back, but I think they realize there's diminishing returns. Yes. Korea is now a very advanced country, yes, so why not keep the students and their money <laughs> right there in Korea? And you have been living there how long? Three years. Three years. And you said that Koreans can manage people well, but not foreigners. What do you mean? <laughs> well, I mean that uh, foreign employees of Samsung and LG uh, tend to stay for just a few years and uh, uh, they learn a lot and uh, perhaps they contribute but they, they become frustrated with the culture and eventually move on. Mm. So um, yes, there's a very strong... Uh, why they do not accept foreign culture or foreign different thoughts or why? Um, yes, that's part of it. I mean, it's a land of contradictions. Uh, okay. You've seen the changes in Korea that uh, that occurred because students educated away from Korea came back and were were allowed to apply what they learned, and that's uh, to change Korean society. That was very impressive. That's innovation is about. It also. is. I mean, if it's not new to the world, at least it's yes. new to some place, and we call what it innovation. Is, what is something in Korea yeah. that Mongolians can learn? Ah. Um, what, what an interesting question. You know, Koreans tend to uh, look upon Mongolians as their ancestors, and they, they're very fascinated with Mongolia. And, of course, there are many Korean businesses mm -hmm. here in Ulaanbaatar. 
but uh, what uh, Mongolia can learn from Korea. Um, the historical circumstances are very different. Uh, maybe it's, um, as one uh, American uh, scholar said, what we have to learn from them is not what to do, but to do it. Because so, so many of the things are, are obvious, but the, the opportunity to grow exports through very large companies like the Chebol, it, it doesn't seem to be present at this time yes, in Mongolia. Yes, they are not here in that scale in Mongolia. Getting foreign exchange, as, as Korea did, as a, as a staging ground for American troops during the Vietnam War, yes. that's a historical circumstance that does not exist yes. in Mongolia. So we need to think of the unique historical circumstances that Mongolia can leverage. You were also mentioning at your presentation at the recent Innovation National Forum that Mongolia could also uh, export its culture. It, this is yes, fashion or something. So. Like Koreans now do their uh, uh, films, movies. Yes. series of TV series of movies. Popular music. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so probably our culture could have, this is also a sort of innovation, isn't it? To export our culture, which, which is unique, the way of thinking of nomads, etc. Yes, I agree. You know, one participant in the forum asked, how can we protect our brand? Uh, cultural exports are easier to protect because authenticity is so difficult to copy. Yes. Now, of course, the trademark issues are the same for everyone, but um, to export fashion or um, particular foods that can only be grown here, things that are uniquely Mongolian, that's highly protectable. And as I, there's a lot of um, interesting fashion design going here. I believe it would be very appealing in the West. But uh, more than that, Korea has had success with... Uh, cultural programming, as you say, much the same way Hollywood did uh, mm -hmm. in the U.S. many years before that. And it causes people to become interested in Korea and Korean mm -hmm. products. So the cultural exports lead the technological exports, but help the technological exports. See, throughout the National Forum, people were talking about not enough commercializing the knowledge or innovation or research results in the country because universities, academia in Mongolia are not connected with businesses and that research mm -hmm. being not so much justified. How do you find and can, how can Mongolia address this issue? Ah. Well, there was talk about national innovation systems mm -hmm. and really every place already has a system. The, the, a system is a collection of elements, in this case uh, entrepreneurs and uh, local government, national government, universities, established companies, NGOs, all these elements. And then to make it a system, then there's connections and communication among the elements. And the Mongolian professors tell us that these connections are very weak in Mongolia or sometimes completely absent. That's the problem. So once those connections are made, creative solutions, new things, new ideas come out. And it is, uh, I think, the best contribution government could make here is to encourage those connections and uh, listen to the ideas that come out. See, uh, now we have uh, discussions in Mongolia. Mm -hmm. On one side, we have scientists. They do their research, but not upon request by yes. a commercial authority, uh, uh, independent commercial uh, organizations, entities. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, this, because it is not organized, they all ask the government to help. But yes. there is also a system which is called clusters. Yes. Which, if government doesn't much intervene, it can work itself. True. So. What would be the, your pref preferred approach on that? I mean, really, government, what the government can do at the end? Oh, governments can give the initial boost to clusters by offering some relocation incentives. You're talking about uh, the process by which a company and many of its supplier companies and customer companies tend to locate together because of the potential to share knowledge mm -hmm. and have uh, 
and, and attract very qualified employees. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to start a cluster from nothing, so a little bit of government incentive and intervention helps get things started. But the ultimate goal with a cluster is to have the next company move to the cluster, not because of the government's marketing efforts, but mm -hmm. because the other companies are already there. Mm -hmm. That's called critical mass, mm -hmm. but it takes a lot of time and determination to get to the, the critical mass uh, see, where the thing is self-sustaining. See, here in Mongolia, we have lock mining resources. Right. We are selling, it depends on the commodity prices, ups and downs. Yeah. Then when money comes, we have this, this Dutch disease, so-called, etc. But uh, this is uh, limited resources, and we say the knowledge is limitless resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, to make this knowledge, at this time of development of Mongolia and the global world, IT technology, can Mongolia be competitive in certain sectors, being a small country in the mm -hmm. world? Can it be competitive? The government seems to have decided to prioritize agriculture and leather products and copper products. Uh, this seems to me rather reasonable. Um, and at least with the agriculture and, and leather, there's the opportunity to, uh, to export things that are uniquely Mongolian mm -hmm. and therefore protectable and therefore rather appealing to the mm -hmm. outside world. I've seen a lot of very impressive things in fashion design here, mm -hmm. which uh, not necessarily leather, but also you have wool and cashmere mm -hmm. production. Mm -hmm. Very beautiful things that I think mm -hmm. will be appealing to the export market. Um, there has to be a, a, a wide agreement that growing export markets is important. There were some comments at yesterday's forum that People said, oh, we have to concentrate on the domestic market first. Mm -hmm. Domestic market is so small. We really so, need to think so export right from the get-go. Yeah, we should think yeah. first of all about the large market. Yes, I China, think so. China, Russia, and the world. Yes, I think so. Uh, you see, let's say, remember the uh, woolen products from New Zealand or mm -hmm. say from Nordic countries. They were peculiar made, they, they were made very popular with the help of some Hollywood stars and whatever through different interest in marketing. Yes. Is it possible for Mongolia to do so or the, in the modern world things are changing? It, how interesting that you mentioned New Zealand because uh, it may not be the most realistic role model country for Mongolia because New Zealand is, is considerably more advanced but in the terms of large empty spaces more stock animals than human population. It has some similarities. Mm -hmm. And uh, clever marketing is part of it. There's a story about New Zealand uh, failing to export one fruit called the, uh, the New Zealand gooseberry. Nobody wanted to, in America and Europe wanted to buy New Zealand gooseberries. So uh, a real estate agent, as I recall, decided to rename it the kiwi fruit, and it became a hit everywhere yes. in the world. Yes. So proper naming and positioning is Name, positioning, be a channeling. Key, That's right, what a that key to getting of things out of Mongolia. Unusual uh, stuff and very interesting success story. You may hope with Mongolia. I hope because yeah, I hope so. see you. You have seen you have seen our teachers, young guys, people, te students. Mm -hmm. They are talented, isn't it? Oh yes. And they can produce something, in particular in IT industry. I thought mm -hmm. that the world market will buy. Yes, it's a. Uh, you know, like um, developing innovative food and leather products, uh, the app economy, developing a phone app is extremely cheap these days. You don't need venture capital investment for that. You need uh, three guys or three or guys and women get together in an apartment and uh, pool their credit cards and you've got enough capital to, uh, to launch a successful app. Uh, it's, uh, thankfully, it's much more easy and democratized these days to get a venture like that off the ground. You got a very interesting prize from US Air Force, five million dollars prize shared. What is that oh, about? Yes. Award about? Uh, a long time ago. That uh. was a grant um, when the Japanese economy was very strong then in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And uh, Japan had been buying um, 
prominent landmarks in the U.S. and there was widespread uh, concern in the U.S. that uh, the Japanese are eating our lunch. So, uh, and they were very talented, the Japanese companies, in uh, uh, commercializing new technologies. So the Air Force of Office of Scientific Research gave grants to 13 uh, American universities to send um, interns, uh, people who are already working in industry, but take a step back to be interns again and send them to Japanese companies. Uh, the challenge was that uh, Japanese students come to America to learn these things, but the advances happen in universities in America. But the advances in Japan were happening in corporate laboratories. So it was our challenge to try to insert these interns into corporate laboratories. And eventually the 13 universities together sent a thousand interns. Uh, very successful in a way, and yet uh, as soon as these interns came back, the Japanese economy crashed and stayed crashed for more than 10 years. Uh, I feel badly in a way that we made so many friends in Japan and they might feel like we turned our back on them after yes, after the crash because we couldn't afford to travel there anymore. You were sent to which place? Oh, um, you were among those thousands. No, I was a, a program manager. I ah, was a okay. principal investigator on, okay. on the grant from And you have been Air sending Force. students. Send, we were giving them preliminary training in Japanese language and culture and uh, it, principles of technology management. They were mostly engineers and scientists. Hmm. And after we gave them that preliminary training, uh, and we had agreements with uh, laboratories at Sony and at uh, many other Japanese companies, then they would go to Japan for a while. Okay. and try to learn. And uh, also, there were talk about free trade agreements yes. among all, bilateral, multilateral, which now we do, for example, we have signed one with Japan. The second uh -huh. is going to happen with Korea and Australia, Canada, and probably all North America, etc. Uh, what kind of benefits and, uh, well, negative sides mm -hmm. in terms of promoting innovation and further products using your innovations for the market if we have that bilateral agreement and what we have to pay attention to? Um, the obvious benefit is cheaper consumer products for almost everyone mm -hmm. under free trade. There are a lot of negatives that are not well publicized. I have to say that I one of the most successful predictions I ever made in my life was back when uh, in the NAFTA times, the North America Free Trade Agreement, when I said, wait, this is going to have negative effects. And uh, the article won a prize and, and it largely came true. Because uh, free trade doesn't mean free trade. It, it doesn't mean that people can travel freely across borders. Primarily means that capital can flow freely across borders. And uh, one danger, for example, is that uh, maybe there's a run-up in the stock market in Mongolia. Mm -hmm. Foreign capital will come in. Uh, it will draw Mongolians to invest in, in securities here, but the average citizen here doesn't have access to the same information that the big mm -hmm. international investors have. Mm -hmm. And when the international investors see a better opportunity in Romania, Mm -hmm. They'll all pull out and the market will crash and the, the Mongolian citizens can be left uh, with large losses. Well, that's, so this that's is just one thing that happens. happened happened somehow in smaller, to smaller degree here. Has it happened? Not necessarily uh -huh. with the stock exchange, uh -huh. but because the whole economy was completely dependent on resource-based money. Uh -huh. Some of them were short-term money for yeah. real estate. Uh -huh. so, now we sort of smaller crash on that, and it's, it still again uh, proves your warning about the natural resources, the uh, yeah. disease kind of right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you studied also other countries, including Taiwan, and you are a professor of one of the universities, visiting professor, and you live in Taiwan now. That's correct. Uh, what is the, your observation in terms of innovation in Taiwan, and what's going on now? I want to tell you that it's based on only two months of having lived in Taiwan so far, so mm -hmm. please don't take this as gospel. But uh, 
whereas Korea is a large company economy, Taiwan is a small and medium mm -hmm. enterprise economy. Mm -hmm. There are a few large Taiwanese companies. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows Acer, for example. And mm -hmm. my, the university where I work is, uh, mm -hmm. is owned by the Far Eastern Group conglomerate, which mm -hmm. is another large mm -hmm. collection of large Taiwanese companies. But for the most part, it's uh, small manufacturing companies mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of shop owners. That's uh, a nation of shop owners and restaurants. Mm -hmm. um, so their challenge is to learn more about exporting. Mm -hmm. uh, their government laboratories encourage advances in manufacturing techniques. So this is what we call process mm -hmm. uh, innovation, mm -hmm. as opposed to product innovation, mm -hmm. which is to introduce exciting new products in mm -hmm. the market. Which mainly was done by Japanese or the yes. 70s. Yes, it's hard to product. They made smaller, more effective. That's right. But now the uh, Taiwanese are improving uh, process. Yes. You know, I was recently there, and I observed that the sharp or the major whatever companies, they ask as a company to produce their products, just label them on with their product. They order, they mm -hmm. do it, mostly in China. And they <laughs> yes. put their name. Mm -hmm. So the small components, important components, brought from Taiwan and installed there. And that's it, process improvement, efficiency, right? Yeah, well, um, I think the dynamic between Taiwan and China is probably the most interesting thing happening right now in geopolitics. Mm -hmm. um, there's this strange mix of rivalry and arm's length and, and close friendships, and what the future will bring is, uh, is just a fascinating thing to uh, think about and to watch. Um. In your uh, lecture presentation, you said um, when we talk about innovation, not necessarily we talk about innovation of technology. Yes. We talk about innovation in the process, in the whatever you do, right? Yes. That, what would be, how it would be applied in a country like Mongolia? You could take the story about the kiwi fruit and yes. say that that's marketing that's innovation. innovation. Yes, you know it's it's completely trivial compared to uh, inventing a new computer chip, yes. but it is something new. Yes, uh, transferring something as we said before, transferring something that's well known in one country it's to the new country. It's new to somebody, so it's it's an innovation there. That's another way uh, to achieve it. So. Um, the United States, uh, as made obvious by the crash mm -hmm. in 2009, mm -hmm. uh, financial innovation is not always a good thing. <laughs> that's, but it's yes. the, the creation of new kinds of securities and, and so forth. That's, uh, if it really helps the, the financial markets um, allocate resources more efficiently, then that's a uh, legitimate uh, innovation that has little to do with technology. There's also some innovations, good ones, but uh, bad ones That's are unfortunately right. prevailing for the last few couple of decades. Uh, yes. you, were so, uh, you were particularly highlighting also the resource cars must be hedged mm -hmm. against. Yes. How do, you, how do you see that in Mongolia happening? Well, I said this morning in the, uh, in the workshop that there is no formula for that. Um, um, a lot of people have studied the symptoms of the natural resource curse, as we call it, but uh, uh, I think nobody has come up with a recipe for, uh, for recovering from it. Uh, I told the group this morning, don't wait for a crisis. In my home state of Texas, my mentor, who came to Texas before I did, and I later followed him, mm -hmm. uh, advocated since the 1960s when he became business dean at University of Texas mm -hmm. that uh, technology innovation is going to be the engine for growth in Texas' future. Uh, no one listened to him because rich Texans had made their wealth in oil and real estate and cattle, and they said, Dr. George is a, obviously a hugely intelligent man, but I don't know what he's talking about. Every Texan knows that wealth depends on oil, real estate, and cattle. Dr. George, to his great merit, uh, persisted for 25 years. And in the 1980s, uh, it happened that the markets in oil, real estate, and cattle in Texas 
crashed simultaneously. And for the first time, Texas investors started to scratch their head and say, maybe we should listen to what Dr. George is saying. And, and they did at the end. They did, and it was very successful for Texas, but mm -hmm. it shouldn't have waited for the crisis. If you are in this natural resource situation, you so should... What basically you're saying is today Mongolia should think about good hedge against yes. this curse. It, yes, that's right. And, uh, looks like we do. Maybe we don't declare it, but I, mm -hmm. I see all around we talk about now innovation, and I keep hearing something on mining, which mm -hmm. is a great news. Yeah. And there is a, such a power. We, the people who would, like Singapore or Taiwan, which has mm -hmm. no natural resources, but they have a fantastic good living. Yeah. So, and I think this, uh, your contribution, and I think the current National Forum could play an important role. What you would advise to sort of grow up homegrown innovation leaders? What can we do? Ah. Well, we need to have to link them together, to give them so they can give each other the kind of moral support and social reinforcement so that they won't get discouraged and give up. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Continue to send uh, students overseas in, in large numbers to mm -hmm. the extent that it's, it's affordable. Mm -hmm. uh, bring them back, give them the latitude to apply what they've learned to change society here. This was successful for Korea and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, you can see the effects in Japan that they did not let mm -hmm. returning students uh, mm -hmm. apply what they learned because mm -hmm. they regarded them as somehow culturally contaminated if they've been away from Japan and come back. It was very harmful. Japan, for Japan. was not accepting back their own students. Oh, of course they came back, but they were not allowed to uh, really implement what they had learned because uh, in Japan there's this view that if you go away and come back, you might be culturally contaminated. Mm -hmm. uh, Korea doesn't feel that way, and Taiwan does not either. So it's a that's a very good thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we should. I would like to start a uh, an international program to. Uh, to train and encourage these young leaders. And I'll be looking for grant money uh, to put together a program. Uh, one of your Mongolian uh, leaders who had a very good education at, in, at two great universities in the United States is uh, head of a, a university in Western Mongolia. Mm -hmm. And she was telling me how lonely she feels and that Dr. there's Yenjima. not much support for She weapons. was on this program recently. Yes. And, and yeah, I'm really, truly encouraged by what she's doing, what mm -hmm. she's completing, and uh, com uh, what yeah. she has been completed. He had already, she has com completed already, and I'm glad that you, you met her. She feels isolated, and we have to make sure that these people are prepared to be local and regional leaders and that they are not isolated. That we have IT that can uh, make uh, communication platforms global, and we need to use that use the platforms for that purpose. Yeah, Dr. Phillips, I suggest you to come back again, maybe in uh, three, four years, five years, and during which I hope our universities are more encouraged. That lady is not feel anymore isolated, <laughs> yes. and Mongolians are full of energy because I believe these are very creative people. Yes. And uh, your contribution here to this forum was uh, very, really interesting and good, and I, I congratulate you and I thank you for that. Thank you. The society here is very vigorous and it's encouraging in that way, and I know that when I come back I'll see big changes. Thank you very much for coming to my show. Thank, thank you, you for having me. Und du siehst ja nur der Mann, der fragt, ob er trügen soll, ob er in Schnick, Butech und Schnee Forum darf, sondern ein Doktor Philipsarzt, der ich höre, lacht.